Today's guest on Crystal Storytellers podcast is novelist and TV producer of the hit series Bones, Kathy Rikes. It's really a tightrope you have to walk because you're dealing with a very dark subject, violent death. And to put humor into that and be sensitive about it, that really takes a, a delicate touch. Get ready to set sail with Kathy Rikes, where she shares fascinating personal stories with Crystal Symphony's cruise director as they sail through Polynesia and the South Pacific. Well, hello, everyone. This is Russ Thomas Grieve, cruise director on the Crystal Symphony, and I am sitting here with novelist and TV producer Kathy Rikes. Kathy produced one of the most compelling dramas on network television, Bones. The show ran for 12 seasons from 2005 to 2016, 246 episodes to be exact. You may know the show, but did you know that it was inspired by Kathy's novels and real life experience? Kathy is a world renowned forensic anthropologist. Her expertise is so extensive and respected that she teaches the FBI how to detect and recover human remains. They say, write what you know. And Kathy does just that, turning her true life experiences into New York Times best-selling thrillers, including Deja Dead, Death Du Jour, Deadly Decisions, Fatal Voyage, Grave Secret, Bare Bones, that's just to name a few out of 25 novels. Did you ever have time to sleep, Kathy? <laughs> oh, yes. I am not one of these people that can go without sleep. I need my six, seven, eight hours. Excellent. <laughs> Kathy was able to do three lectures this cruise aboard the Crystal Symphony. And I can tell you the Galaxy Lounge was packed and the guest found her talks informative, fascinating, and funny. Kathy teaches anthropology at the University of North Carolina. And she has taken a break to join us on this cruise from Valparaiso, Chile, via Easter Island, to the beautiful islands of French Polynesia. One of my favorite destinations, if I might add. Well, let's get down to some conversation, Kathy. And before we do that, I just want to say thank you for being my first victim. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. <laughs> it is our first podcast here uh, aboard the Crystal Symphony, and it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. So uh, I want to ask, first off, our Crystal listeners are naturally curious individuals. First, we want to know how you made the leap from forensic expert to novelist. And then second, I want to know how you made the leap to television. Whoa, I wrote the first book, Deja Dead, um, because two things happened. Two things came together. Back in the late 90s, I made full professor at the university, so I was free to do whatever I wanted to do after that. And I didn't feel like writing another textbook or scientific article. And I had just finished working on a serial murder case. I take the central nugget from a case and use that and spin it off into fiction. So I had a good idea for a book, and I had the freedom to try something new. So that came together. I told myself, I'll submit it, I think I said 50 times. And if I get 50 rejects, I'll take that as a commentary on my writing skills, my fiction writing skills, and go back to my day job. And as it turned out, um, the first publisher to whom I submitted it bought it. So I didn't get any of those papers that authors talk about putting all over their walls. So what about the other 49 letters that you sent out? Did you hear from them? I didn't send out 49. Um, I actually, when I, finished, <laughs> when I finished it, I didn't know anything about commercial publishing. So my daughter had a friend who had a friend who was working for some publishing house. And we decided, well, we'll send it to, to that person, which you don't do. You just don't do that. <laughs> so it turned out this person worked at Scribner, which is a great house, and she was actually an editor, a junior editor. So I wrote a cover letter and mailed it off to Mary Sue via the friend, the friend, the friend, the friend. So Mary Sue's on the other end, and someone has told her that her friend's 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 mother's first novel is coming her way. You know, So Mary Sue was already composing her reject letter. But I, I later learned that she took part of the manuscript home uh, with her. She lived in New York, uh, outside New York, and read it and drove back into Manhattan, got the rest of the manuscript, read the whole manuscript that weekend, sent it up the chain, and they bought it within, um, I don't know, I'm going to say two weeks. So I never sent out any other submission letters. It's a very strange It's story. an unheard of thing. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. really is. So 97 is when you wrote your first uh, Desjardins. I started it in 94. 94. I finished it in 96 and submitted it, and it was published, because it takes a while. It came out in 90. 
seven. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about the struggles. I mean, writing a book, your very first novel, that there had to be struggles in there somewhere. Well, finding the time was the biggest struggle because <laughs> I was teaching full time at university and I was commuting between Charlotte, North Carolina and Montreal, Quebec, doing forensic casework. And I had three kids. So I would have to get up at six in the morning. And that is not my favorite thing to do. Mm. And I would write for a couple of hours before going onto campus. And then I would write on weekends and I would write during vacation breaks. And so, it, you know, it took a couple of years to write the first one. When you read your first review, what was that like? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I, I do remember one comment that uh, I think it was in the Montreal, the English language Montreal paper that said, you know, this character works in North Carolina and commutes to Montreal. Nobody could do that in reality. <laughs> and so, well, yeah, that's what I do. Wow. And were they all positive reviews? Most of them were, yeah. They actually were positive reviews. Um, I think one of them referred to my cops always eating donuts or something, but <laughs> there is no cops eating donuts in my first book, so I'm not sure she read the book. Isn't that the cliche thing? That yeah, exactly. Yes, uh, exactly, yeah. Well, we're going to skip ahead here just a moment. We will come back uh, to the books, but I want to skip ahead. And tell me the moment when Fox Network uh, asked you to turn the novels into a TV show. Did the agents get the call? Did you get the call? How did that work? Yeah, um, it was through an agency, William Morris. It's now called William Morris Endeavor. Mm -hmm. Represents me. They have specialists. Everything is it's a specialized world. So they have people who specialize in translating literary works into television or feature film. So um, she had proposed this to two gentlemen, Barry Josephson and Hart Hansen, and they liked the idea for creating this character. They'd also seen this documentary that had been done about me. This team followed me around for about two years to lots of different situations in which I was working. And they liked that. So we met, we talked on the phone, and we were all just on the same page because I'd had other offers prior to that, but none of them was was really right. But they they wanted the same thing I did. They, they wanted there to be some humor in the show. We didn't want to just create another... CSI type type character. So I agreed um, to let them option the character. And TV, the way it works, the way Hollywood works is it's always if, 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 if. If, okay, now we have Fox that wants to write the script. Fine. Then they write the script. Then it's, well, will we get ordered to pilot? So I remember getting the call when we actually got ordered to go ahead and make the pilot. And then I remember getting the call later and I was at a resort in Mexico saying yeah we've been picked up we're actually going on air and then every year it's still well will we get picked up will we get picked up so it's a wow. very iffy 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 business 12 seasons yeah we did okay <laughs> we did, did okay. okay we did yes. okay absolutely well it seems like true crime documentaries have a real moment right now and uh with the success of series like Making a Murder and The Staircase and podcasts like Serial and Dirty John why are we fascinated with murder? Oh, and that question goes all the way back to Agatha Christie. And, you know, murder mysteries okay. have been around for a long, long time. Uh, you know, people are fascinated with, you know, this dichotomy between good and evil. Mm -hmm. And what's the most evil thing you can do is take someone else's life. And then I think that there's also the fun of um, fun, if you want to call it, of trying to solve the the, the problem, trying to solve the case, who done it and why did they do it? And you, as an author, you plant clues. It's fair to put red herrings in also, but you have to explain everything and they, you can't rely on coincidence and it, it all has to make sense at the end of the, of the novel. I'm talking about fiction here, but I, sure. um, so I think that's part of the fun of why people like to read, um, murder mysteries or view them on television. You personally, uh, this murder always had it always intrigued you i guess yeah well i read nancy drew you know when <laughs> I, I was a kid i don't know if anybody got murdered in those books but i like the mystery genre going way back and it's interesting because now they have an, was it investigative id television there's yes. so many things like that now. yes yes and, uh, see what you created you were on the cusp of well it all. i was on the cusp of uh, some of it of, of creating a strong female forensic scientist as your me main protagonist mm -hmm. well one of the big questions i think on everyone's mind is why would someone choose a career where they spend their life untangling and examining dead bodies for a living Oh, I didn't plan to do that. <laughs> I uh, trained in bioarchaeology 
Um, my doctorate is in bioarchaeology. I was studying ancient skeletons, archaeologically recovered mm-hmm. skeletons. But back in the day, and I'm not going to tell you how far back the day <laughs> was, um, police didn't really understand the process of board certification, that you have to have a way to legitimize who really is an expert. So in North Carolina, where I was living, if they found bones, they didn't really know what to do with them. So they said, well, just take them out to that bones lady out at the university. So they started bringing me cases. This is described, there's a, the book I gave you called The Bone Collection. There is what we think of as an origin story in there. How did Tempe get into forensic anthropology? Well, this is exactly how it happened with me. They brought me bones. I remember my very first case. It was a child who had gone missing. I remember that night seeing it on the news because I had little kids at the time and wondering if this child was out. There was a thunderstorm raging and I'm wondering if this poor little child is out there frightened in this thunderstorm. And um, three months later, they found a little skeleton in the woods and that was this, this child. So that was the very first case that the police came and kind of dragged me into doing. And then I really liked it. I really liked the relevance of it. When you do archaeology, um, it's fascinating, mm-hmm. but you're not going to impact anyone's life. Whereas in forensic anthropology, when you tell a family you've identified their missing member or when you testify in court, you are going to impact someone's life and you can't be wrong. So I really like that. I retrained. I took my board exams and I've been doing it ever since. Wow. So would you say this trial was probably your most... Um craziest memory or I don't know if craziest is the right word, a memorable case that you've ever worked on? It's a very vivid one. I do remember that very vividly. There are others I remember. And and interestingly, Russ, that's a good question because some of the ones I remember most vividly are child homicides Mm -hmm. that I've worked on. Because you related to probably to your child as every... um, I think so. And my kids used to tell me afterwards they knew when I was because I would keep them on a much shorter tether. You know, I'd keep them very close and I wasn't even aware I was doing that. So to this day, is that the one that haunts you the most, or is there another one that really kind of got to you? There's one. Um, this was a little skeleton found, and it was the basis for my book, Bones to Ashes. Mm-hmm. There was a little skeleton found on the border between New Brunswick and Quebec. And that skeleton, it was found thrown over into a ditch beside a highway. And that little skeleton came to me, and I gave the police what I could about you you can't really say gender for someone that young but about the age of the child and and some of the other characteristics that I saw in the scout never got identified and it still hasn't positively but later I was on French language book tour in New Brunswick and um, the Acadian people live there the the, the Acadian are Acadians are French-speaking people uh, and in New Brunswick, they were driven out of Canada back in the, I think, late 1700s. And many of them ended up in New Orleans and they became Arcadians. That's where the term Cajun mm-hmm. comes from. So I learned a lot about the Acadian culture in doing that book. And um, I was talking about this little skeleton in a radio interview. And the police got a phone call saying, um, I think that's my brother. who They were digging uh a cemetery and some kids saw these bones being thrown up into the air and they thought it would be funny to collect them and put them on the school grounds to frighten the younger children. So everything matched. So we thought, okay, we figured out how these bones got in this plastic sack on the side of the road, but we still didn't really know who the child was. And then someone else called and said, uh, that's our brother. He was he was killed by an automobile in 1963, I think. He was eight years old, and he was buried in that cemetery. So after all those years of not knowing who this child was or how he ended up in this plastic sack by the highway, we finally probably have him ID. We're doing uh, mitochondrial DNA testing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That affects me just hearing yeah. the story the, for the first time. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we're going to switch Move gears. On. <laughs> yes, we're going to switch gears here just a little bit. What do you enjoy most about teaching? Teaching, you know, here, I'm not actively teaching right now. Okay. I'm on sabbatical. Um, so what I enjoyed about teaching university, and I did it for many, many years. Again, I'm not going to tell you how many years it was. <laughs> uh, at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, at the Charlotte campus, was interacting with the students. I liked the actual teaching. What I didn't like were things like faculty meetings and 
having to serve on endless committees and that's I don't miss that part but I do miss the the interaction with the students any special students come your way where uh, maybe you see a future for them in uh, doing what you do oh every now and then I get an, an email or I'm contacted by a former student who has in fact gone on uh, or not but some have gone on into forensics it's nice to know that you make a difference in people's lives Thank Sometimes you. you don't always know that mm-hmm. until way beyond the time, but it is nice to know that. Good for you. It is. Um, I would imagine that forensic investigations of crimes can be taxing on one's emotional well-being. When you write about it, is it also emotionally draining uh, or is it a release, cathartics? I don't think I do it because of a cathartic, mm-hmm. um, seeking cathartic relief. Um, there may be some of that as a side effect, but it can be emotionally draining. Um, the only place I... And when you're doing individual casework, you don't really get a lot of support. The only place where we got regular support was when I was working at the Twin Towers following the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York. And there people would wander through our trailer. Um, I worked partly right at Ground Zero and then partly out at the landfill, the Fresh Kills landfill. Um, And preachers and priests and psychologists and people would just casually drop in and say, so how are you doing? And they're looking deeply into your eyes, you know, to see, you know, to see if you're suffering any psychological. You're also debriefed out. So we got psychological support there. But normally on just a day to day casework basis, you don't. So what's the minimal amount of bones that you can find to really make the identification? Gosh, it depends on what condition they're in. Um, You could I've had at least one case where the only evidence I got was through, uh, what do you call that? A chainsaw, a power saw, a chainsaw, and they were just little chips of bone. But now you can do DNA. You need back, back in the day you couldn't. And you, you, you know, you could say, yeah, this is human bone, but that was largely it. But now you can say a lot more if the bones in good enough condition. Boy, that landfill must've been just, uh, just a tough place to work after that. That was tough. Yeah. Yeah, But everybody wanted to do something, you know, so I donate blood or donate sweatshirts or, and so Mm -hmm. I feel lucky that I could actually go out there and dig through the rubble and actually do something. You've done so much in your life. What's next? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm working on a couple of these true crime, um, we're not sure where they're going to go, if it's going to be a mini-series or documentary style or be converted into a feature film, or, but I've got two different ones going on. They're in the very early stages. So So mom is the word, Mom obviously. is the word. That's all I said. Mom didn't do it, though. No, She's mom. okay. That's right. um, you talked uh, in your three lectures here on board, you talked in the first couple <clears throat> about forensics and sciences and the books. And the last one was about Hollywood and taking uh, it to Fox Television. I just have a couple of questions about that. Did you have any say so in who Tempe and Seeley were? Uh, casting. Um, David Boreanis, who played uh, Seeley Booth, was with us from the beginning. Mm-hmm. He was attached to the project very early on. It took a long time to cast the Temperance Brennan character and many actresses read for that part and it was just and then the day that emily read with david everyone just went yes this is the chemistry chemistry. this is it we've got our tempe i had input i wouldn't say i had control by any means but you had a say in who you thought would best fit yeah they would very patiently listen to me Uh uh-huh uh-huh thank you and you know and then go do it the way right and I love that she wrote novels by Kathy. Yes, she did. She did. <laughs> That's and apparently cool. they're much racier than my novels. <laughs> so. How often were you on the set? Every day? Um, only if I was the writer of that episode. Okay. Then I would be on the set all day, every day. And it was about a two-week shoot for each for each episode that we did. Otherwise, I would just get back and forth. I would read every script. Um, but they would send them to me electronically because I live on the East Coast. So it's a long trip. But I would get out there as much as I could. and probably more than they wanted. So I had three goals, to never trip over anything on set, to never let my cell phone go off while we, while we were actively shooting, and there was a third one, I forget, but I, I did live up to those. <laughs> over the 12 years. So yes, over 12 years. <laughs> because I was thinking, if you were on the set every single day for uh, 12 years, that's a lot. That's, it's a lot, but yes, then David is. and Emily were, well, not every, every they're not in every scene, but in the early years, Emily was in every single scene. Wow. 
And I love that you incorporated humor because it's such a heavy subject. And knowing you and having talked to you over the course of the cruise, I can see where the humor comes from. Yeah, and that's a difficult, it's really a type tightrope you have to walk because you're dealing with a very dark subject, violent death. And to put humor into that and be sensitive about it, that really takes a, a delicate touch. Absolutely. Did you keep your director's chair? I, well, I have the back of it, okay. the the canvas backing that goes across the top of the chair. It was a little bulky to take the whole chair, but everyone keeps their with that their is. name on it. Yeah. Do you have it in a special place at home, or is I it, have it in my office? Is it? Yeah, nice. yeah. It's next nice to, to next to a picture of me with ZZ Top, which was one <laughs> of our my favorite of our guest stars. So. ZZ Top. Um, yeah. Uh, Billy Gibbons, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, wow. we had Cindy Lauper, and we had Billy Gibbons, and we had uh, Nora Dunn, and we had. Uh, I can't remember what uh, Penny Marshall. So may she rest in peace. May yes, she rest yes, in peace. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Plethora of great guest stars. We did. We did. Ryan oh. O'Neill. So. Oh, really? He was a recurring, yeah. He was uh, Tempe's father, I think, on oh. the on the show. So he would come in and out. Yeah, oh. as did uh, Billy Gibbons. He was Angela's father. So. But you had no say in that casting. Pretty much just uh, Tempe. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I was around when those were. But Cindy was in one of the episodes I wrote. She was. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I want to ask you one last question. That's, what's been your favorite experience while you've been here? Oh, it has to be Easter Island. Um, that's the only place I've been to show. Other than being on the ship and meeting you, of yeah. course. Um, oh. You know, when I was a kid, I'd say middle school, I read the old uh, Thyre, Thor Heyerdahl books, mm -hmm. uh, Contiki. And I've been fascinated with Easter Island ever since, so... Well, I'm glad you got the chance to experience it. Thank you. So and am I. I am so glad that you are here today and uh, giving our guest a chance to hear a little bit about the behind the scenes of Kathy Ryan. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank so you. a lot of guests who were here really enjoyed you. And so this is for this is for the guests that didn't make it on the cruise. Okay. So. Well, I've been right. tweeting, so I don't know if you've seen any of my tweets, but... Yeah, you might be in some of them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> might? I think that I'm, I know that I am. You have appeared. You have appeared. I have appeared. Yes, yes. Yes. So thank you again for being uh, here and uh, and joining us today. And we'll look forward to seeing you sometime on a Crystal Cruise uh, in the future. In fact, I will I'll be see you in Tokyo. Uh, Tokyo to San Francisco. And I will be with you. Very good. And we'll good. look forward to that, to maybe a feature film in the near future. Well, we'll see. All right. Thanks again, Kathy. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Crystal Storytellers. If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. For more information about upcoming Crystal sailings, please visit www.crystalcruises.com. See you next week when we are joined by a man who's played a wide range of unforgettable roles in both film and television, Bruce McGill. <laughs>